Happy Sabbath, everybody. For those in-house and those joining us online, we thank God that we can be gathered together to worship a God that is worthy of all our worship. And as I said to the group this morning, it's on days like these that I'm reminded of a uh, ditty I did learn as a boy. They taught us that whether the weather be hot, whether the weather be cold, you weather the weather, whatever the weather, whether you like it or not. As we seek to navigate the weather and not allow the weather to navigate us, we thank God that He has afforded us the privilege to be in house. I want to remind those who are watching that church is open, even as we deal with the reality of the inclement weather. As you heard, we are in mourning with Pastor Kevin as he lost his sister this week. Let us continue to pray for him that God will take him through this spirit of mourning. As we continue in worship, with the study of the Word of God, we'll do so by contemplating the question, how is your walk? How is your walk? We turn our attention to our focus text, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. The King James Version says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. This is the word of God, and I believe it. Let's pray together. Father, as we continue in worship with the study of your word, we pray that you will remove every distraction, that you will arrest every attention, that you will speak to our hearts and our heads, that you'll use this feeble mortal clay to share words of truth, words of hope we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Here in these, or with these 13 words of Scripture, we have, neighbor, an example of someone, of a man who walked with God and the result of doing so. And I do believe that these 13 words are still applicable today. I'm fully convinced that the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to record this short, yea, this succinct story of Enoch to relate to us even in 2022 some very profound truths, some very profound principles. This small package of a text does have some valuable truths for us today. And before we unpack this package, it is instructive to note that the operative word, the functional word in this verse is the word walk. What's the word? It's walk. And it comes from the Hebrew halach. Halach. So as we go into our time together in the Word, we'll be unpacking the meaning of halach. We will see that it's not just about movement, but there are other elements to this word walk. Before we do so, it's important for us to rehearse and understand the backdrop, the scaffolding, the context of this verse. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And here is the context. The earth, according to 
the previous chapters of Genesis is in its first millennia, its first thousand-year period. Adam and Eve are contemporaries of most of Earth's inhabitants. And so they are able, Adam and Eve that is, to tell the story of the fall. They're able to describe the nature of their relationship with God before the fall and after the fall. Adam and Eve had experienced firsthand the dire consequences of sin, of disobedience. They had witnessed the death of their, first, their second son at the hands of their first. And God, by this time, by the time we get to chapter 5 of Genesis, God had blessed them with a third son they call Seth. They call whom? Seth. And so in chapter 5, we find that the earth is divided into two groups. How many groups? Two groups. Group number one, those of the Seth line. That is, those persons who seek after God and who seek after his will. And group number two, those of the Cain line. That is, those who live a life of rebellion and defiance against God. But notice, neighbor, two groups. Seth, Cain, two groups. And I do believe, if I understand Scripture correctly, as we move more, as we move closer and closer to the end of time, this world with its varied divisions will be reduced to two groups. Those who worship God according to His, his will, according to His Word, and those who do not. Those who will live their lives in obedience to God and those who will not. Those who live lives of commitment to God and those who will not. But only two groups, Seth, Cain. And it is for that reason that the Bible records its begats. And I'll confess that as a boy growing up in church and doing the Bible year, I was annoyed by the begats, <laughs> by those passages that talk about this person begat this person and that person begat that person. But, but as I grew, as I matured, I came to understand the importance of the begats. You see, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God had made the promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And, 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 and each uh, successive generation were, was, was looking for the seed of the woman. And so the begats became important. You'll find Cain's list of begats in Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 to 24. And Seth's list of begats in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 to 32. And the Bible tells us, in Jude, Jude only has one chapter, uh, verse 14, that Enoch was in the seventh generation from Adam. The Bible says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The first gem, the first thing I'd like for us to unpackage here is the fact, according to the text, that Enoch walked with God. That Enoch did what? That he walked with God. Now, I find it a bit interesting as to when this walk with God of Enoch began. And in verse 21 of chapter 5, on to verse 23, it gives us the timeline as to when this walk with God began with Enoch. Genesis 5, verse 21 says, And Enoch walked with God. Notice, well, it's, it begins by saying, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Verse 22, And Enoch walked with God. Notice, after he begat Methuselah, three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. 
Notice when this walk with God began. The Bible says it began when Enoch begat Methuselah. In other words, it began when Enoch had his first child. It began when Enoch started his family. There was something about having a child, something about having a family, watch this, that changed the dynamic of the relationship between Enoch and God. There's nothing like having a family that can mature a fellow. In her book, Desire of Ages, Ellen White comments, and she talks about how as Enoch interacted with his son, he came to understand experientially the, the love relationship between father and son, and it gave him a new, renewed perspective of his relationship with God. In the context of having a family, his relationship with God was deepened. You know, dear friends, there is, according to uh, some persons, uh, sociologists, they talk about we have the public self and the private self. The public self is, of course, the self that everybody sees at the, at the job, uh, at, at the checkout counter at Walmart, uh, in church. But then we have the private self. That is the person that nobody sees except they are behind the closed doors. And when you are a, a single person living all by yourself, very few persons, if any, will see the private self. But then when you get married, you will discover very soon that there are now other persons who will see the private self. And I have come to appreciate as I grow and mature that there is nobody who knows me better than my wife, Christine, that there is nobody who can give a better testimony as to the, the authenticity of my walk or my relationship with God. What I'm saying is that I can show a one person in public and be a different person in private. Uh, hello? And so there is nothing like a, a family member who sees you behind closed doors to, doors to testify that indeed this is a Christian, this is a true person. Having a family has a way of maturing a person. Before we had our son years ago, uh, there were some things that I was struggling with, but the, the minute we had our son, and I realized that there was now going to be another human being that was going to model me and emulate me. I, I asked God for victory over those things. I did not want by precept or worse by example to pass on these bad habits to another person. And I remember saying to a friend of mine, we grew up together, that man, I had to now become a man because now I have a son. Now I have somebody that's going to look to me, and, and so my relationship with God had to be tighter. The Bible says that this walk with Enoch and God, it changed for the better when he had his first son. So Enoch, the Bible says, walked with God. And the first thing I want you to appreciate about this walking with God is that this word halak is not just about movement, but it denotes relationship. It denotes what? Relationship. Notice the Bible says, the verse says that Enoch walked with God. Notice he did not walk alone. He walked with whom? He walked with God. They took the journey together. It was the prophet Amos who said in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, can two walk except they be agreed. This walking with God meant that Enoch had a relationship with God. This does not mean, though, neighbor, that Enoch became a hermit. It did not mean that for him to walk with God, he had to separate himself from the rest of the world and become a monk. You know, there was a period during Christian history 
called mon monasticism. It was a period where folks believed that they could become pure, they could become righteous by removing themselves from society. It was a period where you had monasteries and convents uh, developing. Folks believed that if they could hide themselves behind monastery walls and convent walls, then they could attain purity. But when we look back on that uh, section of church history, it is replete with several atrocities that took place beyond or behind those monastery and convent walls. That simply separating oneself from society does not make one holy or pure. Enoch was able to walk with God amidst the mundane activities of life. That is, he maintained his communion with God even as he was shopping at Walmart. <laughs> you see, God is constantly inviting you and I to have a relationship with him. Amen? God wants to walk with us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to have a close connection with us. You see, the closer the connection came between Enoch and God, the deeper Enoch sensed his own weaknesses, his own perfections, and the greater became his dependence upon God. And so this walking with God, the first element, it denotes relationship. But this walking with God also denotes movement. Denotes what? Movement. They walked together. They were heading somewhere. You see, neighbor, the relationship between Enoch and God was not static. It was not immobile. It was dynamic it was mobile. The relationship between Enoch and God was progressive. You know, there is nothing quite frustrating to some folks as being in a relationship that is heading nowhere. And I must say that sometimes I am just amazed at how patient some ladies are with us as men. The kind of things they tolerate and they put up with at least for a while. Because you see, you've got some men who I call serial daters. Serial daters. They'll date Polly, they'll date Sue, they'll date Molly and Drew too, but they'll never follow through. Serial daters. And so, they're on this, the umpteenth date, and they're sitting there in the restaurant, sitting at the table, and the waiter comes by, and she says to him, we're not quite ready to order yet. And she stretches over her hand, and she lowers his menu card, and she says to him, where are we going with this? He says, what do you mean? Yeah, where are we going with this? This is the umpteenth date we've, we've been on. You see, I am not into just dating people. I am not here because I wanted somebody to pay for lunch. I could buy lunch all by myself. You see, the first time we went out on a date, I heard wedding bells, though faintly. But with each successive date, the wedding bells got louder and louder in my ears, even as my biological clock was ticking down. I wish I had a witness in the house. And so she says, now, let's not waste my time and yours. I need to know before the waiter comes, where is this going? Because there's nothing more frustrating in life to some folks than being in a relationship that's heading nowhere. You see, God was taking Enoch somewhere. They were walking together. The relationship was getting better. It was getting deeper. It was getting richer. It was getting stronger. God was his guide. 
And as long as Enoch followed him and journeyed with him, he'd be okay. Because someone said that no one gets lost by walking with God. No one gets lost by walking with God. You know, I am one of those persons who is uh, topographically challenged. And that's just a fancy way of saying I get lost easily. And God would have it that he has blessed me with a wife who is good with directions. You see, I've got to go to the place, Dean, over and over and over again before I get it. Christine just needs to go there once, and she can find it the second time. And, and it's, it's, it's really helped me to grow in patience when I'm driving with her and she is trying to give me directions. Because some of you know that there is nothing that can be so emasculating to a man than asking for directions. We'd rather be lost. I wish I had a witness than ask for directions. We'd rather say, well, we're just finding a new route to get there. And so, fellas like me, thank God every day for GPS. But no one ever gets lost walking with God. Amen? Amen. And so, God was taking him on this journey. They journeyed together. And so, it's not just about the relationship. God was moving him from greater to greater, from richer to richer. God was moving him. But let me hasten to say that it was not just about moving from point A to point B. This walking also means that Enoch had a lifestyle, a way of living that pleased God. Enoch walked with God, meaning that he had a life. That was, he was living a life, rather, that was in keeping with God's will. He was living a life that was pleasing to God. For Enoch, it was not a weekend situation. It was not a weekend conversation. It was not a weekend rendezvous. It was not a weekend hookup. For Enoch, it was a lifestyle, a way of being. Enoch was the same fella on the weekend as he was in the week. He was the same fella at the church potluck as he was in the aisle at Walmart. He was the same person. Why? Because he had a lifestyle that was pleasing to God. So much so that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, the Bible says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found. Why? Because God translated him. Why? For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased whom? That he pleased God. A neighbor, according to Genesis, this walk that Enoch had with God continued for 300 years. And so Enoch walked with God. Progressive relationship. Enoch walked with God. A lifestyle. Enoch walked with God. Both journeyed through life together. But the second part of the text says, verse 24 of Genesis 5 says that he walked with God and notice, and he was not. He walked with God and he was not. And this phrase, he was not, literally means that Enoch went missing. It literally means that Enoch vanished from the face of the earth. Why? He was translated. They searched for him. They could not find him. Why? For God took him. As Enoch walked with God, God took him further and further. The relationship grew richer and deeper and stronger. And so watch this. In a spiritual sense, Enoch lost himself and found his identity in God. Enoch reached a point, neighbor, where self no longer existed 
and only God existed for him. You see, as he communed with God, Enoch came more and more to reflect God's divine image. He lost his identity in God. Of times I have discovered in my own spiritual walk that I can become my worst enemy, that in my own spiritual walk that selfishness can not only slow down my walk, it can hijack my walk. And so I have to ensure, neighbor, that with each step I take each day, that it's a step of total surrender to God. That each day I'm laying self on the altar. Each day I'm seeking to lose myself in him. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and he was not. He was crucified. And the only person that lived, according to Paul, was Christ. Third and final, the Bible says Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Why? For God did what? For God took him. God took him literally means that Enoch was translated. He is the first of his kind to do so. When you examine the begats in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Genesis, you'll discover that with, both with Seth's, Seth's line and Cain's line, you'll discover this, this singular element, and it is this. Every one of those begats died. Every one of those begats died except for Enoch. He was translated, the first of his kind to do so. Enoch was transported from this terrestrial plane to the celestial palace. Enoch was taken to another existence, another plane of existence because of the consistency of his walk with God. Someone put it this way that one day as they were walking, Enoch and God journeyed so long and so far that God turned to him and said, you know, Enoch, it seems as if my home is closer than yours. Why don't you come home with me? But I want you to know that before Enoch was translated, the Bible says in Hebrews 5, 11 rather, in verse 5, that Enoch had gained a character that was suitable for heaven, the Bible says that before his translation, notice that last phrase of the verse, that before his translation, Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. So it must be, neighbor, for me and you, we've got to develop a godly character and this godly character is forged through our daily walk with Jesus. The only thing that you and I will take from this world to the next is a character that has been formed and forged according or after the similitude of Jesus Christ. And this is not accomplished overnight. Character is not formed overnight. It is formed as we daily surrender our lives to Jesus. This experience of character development, we call it sanctification. God, with each passing day, as we surrender to Him, and through the ministry and agency of the Holy Spirit, He seeks to perfect His character in and through us. Because, neighbor, our character will be the only thing that we take from this world to the next. One person said that character is about what we do when no one is looking. A character is not formed overnight, and it is formed as we surrender daily to God. And so we ask us today 
How is your walk? Some years ago, I read an issue of Discovery Magazine where a scientific journalist, Robert Kunzig, uh, penned an article entitled The Physics of Walking, Why Human Beings Move Like an Imperfect Pendulum. And in this piece, he describes walking in a very scientific way, how walking happens, how it occurs. He describes it this way. He says, with each step you walk, you yourself become an inverted pendulum. You pivot around the foot that's on the ground, and as you're using that leg to pole vault, your center of mass somewhere in the belly describes an arc as you plant a foot on the ground in front of you, and the ground now exerts a force back up in your leg that slows you as you move and you continue on that arch. At that point, he says, what is kinetic energy is at a minimum, but your potential enemy energy is at a, as a maximum as you move forward, as you accelerate again. And if you understood all of that, you're smarter than I thought. <laughs> But then I asked a physical therapist working with a patient who is learning to walk, and she said, you know, Pastor Rose, some folks, sometimes we never appreciate mobility until we lose it. And she described working with a patient and teaching that person to walk again. There has to be a game plan, she says. You've got to be intentional about it. But you've got to work at the patient's pace, even as you strengthen the muscles, even as you take them through the paces. You've got to do it a step at a time. You've got to do it incrementally, she says. But you've got to have a game plan. You've got to be intentional about it. You've got to have a goal. And the goal is for that patient to be able to move unassisted. For some patients, she says, it may take days. For some months, weeks, even years. But the goal is to get that patient to walk again. Neighbor, as you look at your life today, how is your walk? That is... Is your life in alignment with God's will, in alignment with God's purposes for you? How is your walk with Him? Are you walking with Him? Or are you trying to make life on your own? How is your walk? Are you the same place You were last year, this year. Recently, I heard of a a journalist from NPR who had gone to a very remote uh, African country to test out exercise uh, machines and just to see how people respond to them. And he described taking a treadmill out in this backward, as we would say, desert place. And he left it, he said, in the center of the village. And people were looking at this machinery, wondering what it was. And he observed their reaction day in, day out to it. And then he said from a battery that he had, he had, he had acquired and had fixed up, he started the machinery and he started to run on the machinery. And the folks were fascinated, fascinated that he was moving on this machinery. And then he said to the the chief of the village, what do you think of this? He said, it's strange that you've worked up all that energy, but you're still in the same place. You've worked up all that energy, 
but you're still in the same place. You see, for us, when we move, we're moving from place to place, but you've worked up all this energy, and you're still in the same place. How is your walk? Are you on a treadmill, or are you on that path that God is moving you from place to place? I want my walk with God to be consistent. How about you? I want my, God, my walk with God to be progressive. How about you? I want to finally realize in my life that which they taught me in children's Sabbath school, that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I want every day with Him to be sweeter than the day before. How about you? Stand with me to your feet. Stand with me to your feet. And those who are watching, God is wanting to have a relationship with you if you've not yet done so. We want to help you with next steps. The number is there on your screen. Reach out to us as we seek to encourage faith. Father God, we thank you so much that in a world filled with snares and pitfalls, we don't have to walk alone. That we have Jesus to walk with us, to help us navigate this wicked and cruel world. Take our hand. Lead us step by step. We pray for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, that person who has not yet made that commitment to you, that person who has not yet placed their hand in yours. Say, O oh Master, let me walk with Thee. Through the instrumentality of Your Holy Spirit, You speak to that heart and bring them to conviction. Help us day by day to walk with You. Move us from glory to glory to glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go. You may be seated.